Um, we're joined today by Kenton Fernandez um, to talk to you about his new book, Sub Imperial Power Australia in the International Arena. And it is, I haven't read it yet, I must admit, I usually always try to read these books before these events, but I haven't read it on the table. Um, but having read uh, a review and the um, of it. It looks like quite a challenging and thought-provoking um, analysis, not only of Australia's um, foreign policy, but about place in the world and how we see ourselves. Um, and said in the word, he categorically debunks Australia's greatest myth, that of its own independence. Um, Clinton is a professor of international and political studies at the University of New South Wales. He is a former army officer. And he's published in the relation on the relationship between science, uh, diplomacy, and international law, um, intelligence operations in foreign policy, the political and regulatory implications of new technology, and Australia's external relations with the Middle East. His research in the Future Operations Research Group of UNSW analyzes the operational environment and the threats, risks, and opportunities that military forces will face in the 20th also contributed a really valuable chapter that Janet and I um, so interested in going what happens next. Um, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to hearing from him. I won't hold you up any longer other than to say you do have copies of the available sale today. Um, special for the After hearing what Clinton has to say. Thanks, Clinton. Thank you very much. But I have to stand here, so is this am I the right spot? You are. Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you, Emma, for inviting me to this uh, this talk. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the book itself is about Australia in the international arena. So it's not just about our foreign relations, but about ourselves, as well as how we relate to the international arena. Uh, well, since per capita is a think tank devoted to uh, to I think inequality. Uh, I think you would be interested in the parts of the book that deal with uh, the unique features of our economy and how they are, they are, they resulted in the situation we are in. Uh, one key concept is the distinction between economic growth and economic development. Growth is simply about increasing the size of your economy, increasing your economic activity. But economic development is something different. It's about a diversification. It's about uh, the different types of, of products you can produce, uh, the, uh, the ability to, uh, to do more than be a quarry or a farm, but to actually climb up the technological ladder. And that concept is captured uh, in the issue of economic complexity. The question of economic complexity uh, has been developed by a number of economists, led by Ricardo Hausman and Hahn. Economic complexity is a function of your diversity, the different types of products you can export, as well as the products ubiquity. How many, how many other countries are doing the same thing? The more complex you are, the more advanced you are as an economy. Now, colonies tend to be low in economic complexity because they are they are there in order to export their coal, their iron ore. Uh, but not to develop themselves. They're basically there to service uh, uh, more advanced economies. The most economically complex countries uh, are Japan, Germany, uh, South Korea, Switzerland, and so on. Um, and there's a list, you can just look at the Atlas of Economic Complexity, which is available online. Uh, and it, it tracks, generally speaking, countries that belong to the organization of uh, the OECD, basically, uh, the 24 advanced economies, they tend to be the more economically compl uh, complex uh, uh, countries. Well, Australia is not in the top 10, nor in the top 20, nor in the top 30. Uh, Australia is currently 91. Uh, we are between Pakistan, uh, Laos, uh, Bangladesh, Honduras, uh, and so on. And the reason for that is we have a wealthy but a dependent economy. We, we have our primary exports tend to be things that former colonies used to have uh, iron ore, coal, briquettes, wheat, beef, things like that. Uh, and so, one thing that we should be trying to focus on is how do we not just how do we grow our the size of our economy, uh, 
you know, by exporting room. But how do we get to climb the, the technological ladder? How do we become a more economically complex uh, society? And the reason I say we are a sub-imperial power rather than a middle power is uh, that a middle power, the term middle power doesn't really explain very much. It means that we're somewhere in the middle economically, or we're maybe not as high, as powerful as a superpower, uh, but we're not really poor either. So maybe we're a middle power, and it doesn't provide you with any any kind of explanation. By contrast, if you consider the term empire, um, an empire is not simply the physical occupation of another country. An empire is about controlling another country's sovereignty. You can you can control other countries' sovereignty without being physically in control of it. So physical control and physical occupation is when, say, the British Raj was ruling India di directly, or France was ruling India China directly. But the essence of an empire is not about control of territory, it's about control of sovereignty. And we retain the subordination of our sovereignty that we inherited from the British, um, in which uh, the aim of our ports was not to be connected to each other, the capital cities, but really to export to London. Um, and so we retain uh, an economic profile that is closer to that of a developing country than to a developed country. Okay, so we are as economically simple um, as, say, Cambodia, Kazakhstan, uh, Saudi Arabia, Laos. Now, we, but that doesn't mean we're poor. We're a wealthy country, so we're wealthy but dependent. And that is the essence of what it means to be sub-imperial. And I want to suggest something that's not original to me. Uh, but the reason we have a foreign policy is that we can basically put our domestic policy into effect. That's the reason why any, any country has a foreign policy, so that it can implement its domestic policy. And that, that means that your, your, ex, your foreign policy is basically the external expression of your domestic structure. It is, uh, it is how you express yourself externally because of who you are internally. And that insight is not just mine, it's, I'm actually quoting Paul Haslock, uh, a foreign minister who was probably the, the best explainer of foreign policy who ever, to have become foreign minister. Now, here's an example of what we could do. We want it to be economically complex. We want to have economic development, not just growth. In 2013, Geoscience Australia did a study called Critical Commodities for a High-Tech World. Uh, what commodities, what minerals, what metals are needed for a high-tech economy? Things that power uh, our um, uh, cars, uh, tablets, smartphones, computers, uh, things that will help with the renewable energy transition, the rare earths and other metals from the lanthanide group of the periodic table. It turns out that Australia is rich in critical commodities for a high-tech world. Now, if you wanted to have economic development, what you do is set up a national critical minerals company. And then you'd invite foreign countries with advanced technology to come in. And you'd say, uh, you can use some of our critical minerals, but show us what you're doing, and let's have some technology transfer. Uh, that's really the only way you can, you can do it. Okay, so there's got to be some mutual benefit uh, in which, you can, you know, if you know how to man manufacture electric vehicles, if you know how to manufacture semi-autonomous vehicles, or whatever else you want to do in the future, um, you can use our, our minerals and our resources, but show us what you're doing. And so we can also, um, you know, do, build some of it here. But that's not what Australia has chosen to do. What we've done is set up a critical minerals facilitation office. And the aim of the office is to uh, be relevant to the European Union and the United States so that they can come and carve up the critical minerals, manufacture them over there, and then we buy the finished products, the electric vehicles. Uh, now, until that, uh, until that attitude or that that structure is changed, I just don't see any hope uh, of uh, economic development as opposed to economic growth. The business press understands this very clearly. In fact, um, primary sources that I use are from the archives and also the Financial Times, and they say that Australian officials' ears prick up when they hear the European Union and the USA coming because they want to be relevant to provide these critical minerals. Uh, to the facilitation office. And here what we're talking about, after all, is the economic doctrine of comparative advantage. Uh, comparative advantage is you, you focus on exporting things that you are especially competitive in, and other, other countries will focus on what they are especially competitive in. I'll give the technical definition uh, in the uh, Comparative advantage is also a code for staying in your place. 
don't try to develop. Um, perhaps the greatest economist of his era, Adam Smith, had some advice to the American colonies. This was from The Wealth of Nations, uh, the book in 1776. He tells the American colonies, um, what you want to do is focus on agriculture. Don't worry about manufacturing. You know, we'll manufacture and we will start doing the industrial revolution and things like that. You're, you're rich in, in agriculture. That's what you should focus on. But the United States actually defeated uh, Britain and declared independence. So a huge help of France, I guess we see. Uh, and uh, was able to disregard that advice from the greatest economist of his era, Adam Smith, who in a sense was sort of free capitalist. But the theory was developed in greater, in greater uh, sophistication by David Ricardo. If the United States had followed the principle of comparative advantage by focusing only on what it, what it was written at any given time, it today would be exporting bison meat uh, and furs. Uh, it wouldn't have a steel industry. Uh, it would basically be a colony exporting raw materials. Right? Now, that's comparative advantage, which can work if there is some economic synergy and both sides going to benefit. But generally, what it means is stay in your place and don't bother developing. There was a time when uh, Australia disregarded <clears throat> the principles of comparative advantage, and the United States was not happy with it. So in the post-war era, uh, the, a high level of US planning group complained that Australia was following, was pursuing ill-conceived programs of industrialization. <laughs> uh, now that's the direct quote. Wow. The high, high level planning study said that Australia is, is pursuing ill-conceived uh, uh, programs of industrialization. What they should be doing is producing agriculture, wheat, grain, you know, beef, and so on, for the global economy, and that helps the United States. But of course, as we know, uh, the, uh, the the white paper on, on full employment of 1945, followed by uh, programs of free industrialization, um, certain types of immigration, the Snowy Mountain scheme, uh, and the Holden Car, uh, all of those things contributed you know, more motivated by a spirit of economic nationalism, economic confidence, a desire to kind of be different uh, and not just be a mere colony. All of those things were a violation of the principles of economic advantage. And they occurred during the era of regimented capitalism, uh, where the aim, of, finance, of, the aim of, of the economic system was to make finance the servant, not the master of capitalism. Uh, Morgan Tower, for example, the Treasury Secretary to, to Roosevelt said that the aim of Bretton Woods um, was to take the usurious moneylenders, kick them out of the temple of finance. Uh, uh, Keynes, for example, called for the euthanasia of the Rentium. Uh, so the aim was to make finance uh, the servant of capital. We've, we've since had the neoliberal era, uh, which is, I believe, come to an end um, in this month, um, where finance is. Uh, uh, become the master of capital. Uh, this is since the late 1970s. And um, as a result, what we've seen is not quick growth, even, but really stagnant growth, other than for the finance sector, which has boomed. Um, and so the point I want to make is that when we engage with the United States or the European Union in trade policy to, to you know, have, have them carve up bits of the continent, uh, ship them north, and then we can then sell each other $7 copies of the proceeds. Um, well, that's not that's economic growth, certainly, and it's a model that's been followed for some time, but it's not, a, not nothing to do with economic development. And I don't think that you can actually talk seriously about fighting uh, inequality unless you're in control of your own economy to a certain extent, uh, you know, you, unless you're able to assert to the policy tools and the policy levers in order to do that. So that's what I have to say about, about uh, the economic side of our dependence. It is not by, by no means going to be said to be a, a complete failure. A, it is still a country that is very wealthy that immigrants want to come to, um, but it, it also places a huge limit on what we are able to do um, as a result of our, of our sub-imperial stance. Now, the sub-imperial stance has, a, uh, has uh, an external expression in foreign affairs and defense. Here's what I mean. Uh, for the joint defense facilities at Pine Gap, uh, which is where uh, you know the satellite ground control station, uh, which controls the observational and uh, signals intelligence uh, satellites uh, in, in, uh, that, are, that are spread basically from around um, Yemen uh, to around Japan. Um, 
United States senators are able to go to Pine Gap and get a confidential briefing, uh, but Australian senators are not. Now, that's a deliberate choice. Um, United States, uh, the U US uh, Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committees and the, uh, the so-called Gang of Four, that's the, the majority leader of the Senate, um, the minority leader in the Senate, uh, majority leader in the US Congress, uh, minority leader in the US Congress, they see the same intelligence as the United States President. Um, this is a reaction to Richard Nixon's illegal bombing of Cambodia, uh, the Church Committee's response to, you know, the re revelations of assassination campaigns. So the U.S. committees, their congressional committees, have oversight of the intelligence agencies. Okay, we do, we do not. Uh, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, by its own charter, the Intelligence Services Act, Section 29, it says they're not allowed to examine any intelligence operation with a past present or proposed. Our own, and that's choice, okay? So our intelligence agencies, uh, the only thing that we parliamentary committees can look at is the administration and financing of the agencies. So, you know, is there enough gender balance in the intelligence agencies? Is there any bullying going on in the intelligence agencies? But actual operations, uh, you know, are not allowed. Now, the United States has a War Powers Resolution, 1973, uh, whereby Congress will make the final decision as to whether a war can be continued. We don't. In, uh, and that's a deliberate choice. It, it means we are, we are, and the, the reason for it is we want to be able to go to the United States and say, what you can't do, do because of congressional oversight, we can do. We have no parliamentary oversight, there's no political interference, but somebody else might call you know, democratic accountability or democratic uh, control. We don't have that. Um, in Afghanistan, when there were calls every year to renew, uh, to renew the, the troop deployments, the Netherlands said, no, we actually have parliamentary authorization requirements. We will have to debate in our own parliament in the Netherlands whether we send Dutch troops into Helmand province, Uruzgan province, or wherever else. We, Australia doesn't have that. Um, that's what I mean by southern imperialism. But the reason I wrote the book was to show that these are not sort of individual anomalies, but they are part of an integrated system. It is Australia in the, in the international arena. The reason we don't exert, exert our sovereignty on the way our defense force is deployed, how it's deployed, for how long it's deployed, is tied to the, re the, the reason we don't have control over our, our economic system. Um, the, the, the book goes into some of the earlier aspects of our constitutional history as well, about the way in which the rights of British investors uh, were protected um, uniquely. Uh, it's in the covering clause five of the, the constitution preamble. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that these are, these are external expressions of, a, of, of an internal dependency, a wealthy but dependent uh, economy. When it comes to, uh, to, foreign, to foreign policy, um, I also look at how you can identify what a sub-imperial power is. Sub-imperial power is both sub-imperial and powerful. It's not a vassal state. We are not a client state of anybody else. It's a deliberate choice to subordinate sovereignty in the interest of the global imperial system. And the United States sits at the apex of this hierarchically structured imperial system. So um, it means that uh, we will support um, Israel at the United States nations in the general assembly, even though they've been caught forging Australian passports uh, and endangering the security of Australians who travel through, around the Middle East. And we know this from the leaked WikiLeaks cables, okay, so that's also in the book, uh, that uh, we are doing this because it's important, you know, Israel plays an important role in a much more important area of the world than Australia. Uh, it, is, it also has a wealthy economy like Australia's, uh, a, a public that is still very supportive of the alliance with the United States, like Australia, uh, and it exercises power in the Middle East, protects US, back, US uh, supported regimes, the Arab, Arab dictatorships. These are basically you know, petrol stations <clears throat> owned by families, not real countries. Now, and so these are the ones that are, um, it, it, it's protected by Israel, and so we vote in support of them. Um, and so the, the, the leaked conversations <clears throat> between the United States Embassy and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade are in the book, which explain why we're going to keep supporting a, a fellow sub-imperial power 
even though in conduct at times harms you. And that's not a failure of policy, it's not immoral or anything like that. There's a statecraft is, is, the, is the way it's done. Uh, I think I'll end uh, finally by looking at, because uh, I'd like some more questions, you know, uh, by looking at the, the issue of submarines. I mean, we are in a financial crisis, uh, a fiscal crisis. I mean, there is, there's a, a budget black hole, of, you know, there's, uh, there's a budget coming out on the 25th of October next week. Uh, but we've said we are going to buy nuclear powered submarines from the United States. Uh, now, we say we're going to buy nuclear powered submarines from the United States. And uh, I think we should look at we should, we should doubt that state we are not buying nuclear powered submarines from the United States. Okay? We are subsidizing the US Navy's nuclear powered uh, submarine budget. Um, so here's, 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 the, here's the argument. If you wanted to defend Australia, you need submarines. And I think it's impossible to go seriously to the public with any kind of agenda, progressive or otherwise, if you haven't got a credible plan uh, to defend Australia. It's you know, utopianism and being a good international citizen is not how you defend Australia. You actually have to have, you know, killing power. Submarines are extremely important um, because they are the most complex type of warfare that, that can be mastered. And anti-submarine warfare, hunting submarines, most complex kind of type of warfare you can find. The possession of a, an effective submarine fleet causes so many problems for any, any country that's hostile to Australia. Um, that it is, it must be preserved and protected. We must have submarines. Okay, that's my position. That's my argument. But we want submarines. We should have submarines that are designed to defend Australia. That is not the aim of of the submarine purchase decision, nor is it the aim of our defence policy. The aim of our defence policy is not to defend Australia. The aim of our defence policy is to show relevance to the United States. That is, it upholds the imperial, the imperial order and security is understood in that sense. So the submarines, we are going to <coughs> pay the United States to install here. I won't say buy. Uh, will cost $171 billion for eight nuclear power boats. Okay. The advantage of nuclear power submarines is it allows you to, to go 200 meters under the water and then go travel at 25 knots and to be able to stay submerged and lurk indefinitely because it takes, it's 50 years before the nuclear reactor in the submarine is, uh, is going to run out of fuel. That said, no one's actually going to stay underwater for, say, for 50 years. Uh, basically, six to eight weeks is the, the outside age of a normal patrol. Uh, once you get past eight weeks, the crew goes nuts. Uh, anybody who's been in a Quarantine and pandemic was here. I understand what I'm talking about. Far worse, far worse inside a submarine. Um, that's been the reason why we've always had these problems with these colored glass boats, by the way, because we demand of our conventionally powered submarines tasks that no conventionally powered navy ever demands of its boats. We want our submarines to be able to patrol in the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, not stay 5,000 nautical miles off the coast of Sydney or Perth. Uh, and then collect intelligence and do surveillance. That's what submarines designed to defend Australia would do. Okay. There are ultra quiet submarines that are bought and used uh, by Germany, Spain, Italy, uh, by, uh, by Singapore. Uh, and so we don't need these in South Korea as well. Japan, same. We don't need uh, nuclear submarines. But the aim of doing that is to show relevance to the United States. What would these conventionally powered submarines, the ultra quiet submarines, cost? Uh, they would cost, if you wanted to buy 20 boats, 20 submarines, it would cost 30 billion. Instead, we're looking at eight for 171. Now, the people who do the planning, uh, I spent 15 years in 15, 16 years in the AEF. Uh, I know some of these people, but more importantly, I know immediately how they think, how they see things. Is that this is not a this is not an accident, it's not a mistake, it's not an oversight, it's deliberate. It is done in order to make it impossible for a future Australian government to have an independent defense policy. That's the reason why it's been done. It is the external expression of an internal dependence, wealthy but dependent. <clears throat> Nuclear power submarines, by the way, are noisy compared to an ultra-required diesel electric submarine. 
or, or in air independent propulsion submarines, air independent propulsion AIP submarines, uh, they convert um, they convert chemical energy, typically hydrogen, into electric energy in the, in the batteries. Uh, and they are ultra quiet. Nuclear powered submarines, you always, even when you're very quiet, you have to keep the reactor coolant pumps running. There are meshing gears in between the propellers and the steam turbines. They're noisy. Okay. <clears throat> Compared to a, a conventional submarine, which is what's ideal for Australia, uh, it's, it's extremely you know, irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But the aim of these boats is to show relevance to the United States. The reason we had the longest war in our history, this is in Afghanistan, if you don't count frontier wars, uh, the longest war in our history in Afghanistan was there because of, of, of the importance of showing relevance to the United States. Okay. But the real goal was never disclosed. In fact, what we did was tell everybody that we are going to help reconstruct Afghanistan and stop terrorism. And then you, you take the equivalent of VFL footballers, this is the special forces, send them to a very different society like Afghanistan for 20 years with no clear mission, no, no particular uh, way of, of, of even achieving the mission. And then you wonder why war crimes uh, you know, uh, but the real goal, which is to show relevance to the United States, was never disclosed. In fact, the fake goal was was not. And the defense minister, who I think since Vietnam, no defense minister has attended military, more military funerals than Stephen Smith, um, made this defense minister from 20, 2007, period onwards, uh, with a brief foreign minister. Um, and the chief of the defense force was uh, Angus Hughes. Well, the two of them are now conducting an independent strategic review. Um, and Mr. Smith has been announced as the High Commissioner to the Court of St. James, the ambassador to the UK, effectively. Uh, and so one needn't doubt it. Have, there's no doubt about what the review is going to conclude. It'll conclude that we're in a very deteriorating strategic environment. Or we need to uh, have closer relations with the United States. We need to have interoperability, um, and that's basically uh, what, what's uh, what's occurring. So basically, that's where um, I, I would like to leave it by by pointing out that the book looks at uh, foreign relations, but Australia's in the international arena. It is not simply about what we do overseas, but the domestic roots um, that create the conditions uh, that inform what we do. Overseas. I'd be happy to take any questions you you have, whether it's on economics or history or you mentioned that we're 91st on the chart. Yes. We want to expect. We happen to be where we're sitting right now, we're in the middle of a hub of highly sophisticated uh, institutions devoted to high level medical research. Yeah. We've got like Bernard Dowdy, we've got JSL doing incredible things in this. Um we have I, I gather, and I might be wrong, some of five thousand PhD uh, medical scientists working in Parkville and surrounding environment. That doesn't sound like it's true. No, it doesn't. Uh, but the the uh, uh, you know the atlas of economic complexity uh, does uh, you know, deliver results, but it does show that they might have a small high tech uh, component of our society. But the bulk of our exports are not in high tech products. Uh, they they are in uh, in wheat, beef, iron ore, uh, and uh, other primary products, including tourism. Education is the exception as a service. Uh, but so that that would account for uh, for the uh, the figures you you pointed out. Uh, but in general, though, we uh, we we are not. Uh, or we are dependent. Um, that's the, the reason for you have economic complexity. I say we are a wealthy but dependent economy. On the question of CSL, I mean, I you are aware, of course, of the uh, the, the sell off of CSL for about uh, a, a, a song. You know, CSL, which is the second or third largest third, third largest company on the stock exchange by by market capitalization. It's uh, it started its life in 1916, I think, as Commonwealth of Serum Laboratories. Um, and it developed, uh, you know, the vaccine, the venom, the, the, the venoms, anti venom uh, products. Its primary 
materials it was using was plasma, which hundreds of thousands of Australians literally donated their blood. Uh, it was sold off for, you know, a song, I think $200 million or $220 million. <laughs> Two dollars a share. Well, today, uh, I look. I, admittedly, I haven't checked. Two ninety. Two ninety. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, that 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 um, that shows that um, it's 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 sort of uh, the privatization of the profits, um, in which we have, there's a choice to to sell off, uh, you know, these national assets. Um, I mean, but there are other things that you talk about with intellectual. Property that I, I've written a chapter in a book edited by uh, by Professor McCallman and, and uh, uh, Emma Dawson, uh, which look at the way in which intellectual property rights are are, are done in Australia. So intellectual property, which you mentioned about this uh, the, this high tech sector we're in, uh, our patents are the world's longest. We have twenty year patents, um, and we allow evergreening. So the Australia United States Free Trade Agreement, two thousand and four. Uh, allows evergreening of pharmaceutical products. So they change a molecule here or there, and then the, the patent get, gets extended. And a patent, an intellectual property, uh, you know, the issue of patent, um, I have looked in the book at the history of patents. Uh, and the aim of patent law used to be to, uh, uh, to give society some benefit. There had to be some economic case. Instead, it's been replaced with a legal case. <clears throat> if there's some issue of novelty, what, what level of novelty should you have? Um, so the evergreening of patents is something that we do that uh, other countries don't. Um, and we also are involved in things like investor state dispute settlement provisions, ISDS agreements in our free trade agreements, all of which reduce the ability of governments to take action to do economic development rather than growth. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. No, surely we've got more questions or comments from her. Yeah. Um, doing use moment, the report that came out of defense in 2013, looking at the importance of manufacturing for defense here in this country. Yep. I forget the name of the author, if you remember it. Was this buried as part of the construct that you put? Us today. Yes. Is that why it was buried? Yes. The, okay. uh, Can you remind me? Uh, I'll talk about I can't. They, they're two senior moments. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> the, 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 the thing is, there was a couple of guys there. It was like a. Yeah. Yeah. Unusual. Got the gum, began with the gum or yeah, gum look. Exactly. exactly right. So he became the head of what, what was turned into Defense and Material Organization. Mm -hmm. Stephen Gumley, I think his name was. I, something. Yeah. yeah. Why was it? Um, it was buried because uh, the aim of our foreign of our defense policy was to be interoperable with the United States. And if, if that country is producing equipment, then we, we prefer to buy it from them rather than to build it here. And we do build things for defense, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, in Bendigo, for example, is where you have the armed personnel carriers, the Bushmasters, some of these are now being field tested in Ukraine. We've donated a whole bunch of these. Bushmasters to um, uh, to Ukraine, so the field test results of how strong and good they are. Uh, but yes, that that's the the idea was to be interoperable, and inter actually interoperability with an imperial power is goes deep in, in our history. Uh, so even before the First World War, uh, the defense minister was George Pierce, and he had a choice: do we use the Canadian Roth rifle for the the infantry? Uh, or the Lee Enfield. The Canadian Ross rifle was much better. Uh, we chose the Lee Enfield because it was, you don't agree with that? No, I don't agree with that, but the Ross rifle is a piece of junk. Well, uh, uh, just, to, just to be clear on what's been said, because I didn't be fair to you, uh, uh, there was a gentleman from the field who disagreed with the idea that the Ross rifle was better. I would refer you to a PhD thesis by Lewis Fredrickson on the development of uh, of Australian infantry tactics um, in the lead up to the, and during the First World War. And that's where the thought comes from. The point being that uh, George Pierce chose the Lee Enfield for its interoperability, not because uh, it was somehow better in, in, in some other way than the Ross Rifle. Interoperability is basically the hallmark of Australian purchases. Um, you know, we, we want it to be interoperable with the United States. Um, more than uh, interoperability is more important for us than 
um, cost or even performance as submarine deal can tell you. Um, so that's basically why we didn't buy, we didn't do those things. But we did do a lot of manufacturing of defense stocks uh, in the Second World War. Uh, you know, there's a great book by David Edgerton on, uh, uh, on, on the way the British won uh, World War II. And they won because of the empire. I mean, there was, you know, refrigerated ships that were able to take beef across from New Zealand and Australia. Um, there was uh, uh, the, of the, I, can't, I don't have the figures on top of my head, but a significant proportion of the rifles and the ammunition comes out of Lithgow. So, actually, um, and so we were able to do those things. But when we do defense manufacturing, it is done for the purpose of being interoperable, not for the purpose of, sort of defending Australia. And that, that's how they see defense. They see defense as imperial defense um, rather than uh, you know, straightforward defense. And that's going to come to a real head. Uh, sometime this decade, uh, because unlike the Taliban, which didn't even have an air force, uh, you know, China does have an air force, um, and these submarines and these frigates that are going to go across uh, will have, uh, you know, very serious, very massive environment. Um, we lost 42 or 43 soldiers in Afghanistan over a 15, 20 year period. We could lose 190 sailors in one afternoon, and that's how many are on a frigate. Uh, and what's not been contemplated because of the particular sociology of the defense establishment is the societal fracture that will occur. The anti-Chinese type feelings uh, that will start coming up uh, once we start losing uh, troops and sailors uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, and that's, that's where we're heading basically with these submarine purchases, and these so-called freedom of navigation uh, operations. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll wait my turn. No, no. Sure. Um, I was going to go back to when you talked about the American interference with Australia's economic. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, really, from starting from a base where on the end of the 30s, we were very short, but still late. We missed it away so little in skill development in the workforce. The, 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 Technical education up to then not enough apprenticeships. And yet, within five years, we've got an extra industry. We've got a major munitions yes. industry. It was done very rapidly and very well. Mm -hmm. um, and that does translate over a bit into the car industry, like this. But then we get into this thing that you're describing mm -hmm. where uh, the, 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 the capital just doesn't come through mm -hmm. to Australia to be able to do those things. And, Knowing all the things that CSIRO has developed, starting with solar panels, uh, which we uh, then do not develop at all. It always goes overseas. And so the yes. whole story, we might be able to do high-tech things in inventions, but we've got no capacity to actually translate that yes. into uh, economic activity. Yes. Uh, so this is still being a, a colony. We just yeah, well, one, one thing that should happen is to think very seriously about the way intellectual property is handled and who gets to handle it. I mean, given the government's fund, a lot of the high tech research that the gentleman up there was talking about in this um, you know, educational precinct, there's no reason why the Commonwealth shouldn't retain, say, 49% of, uh, of, of the value of, of, an, of intellectual property. Um, you know, because that allows uh, the investor, the, the, that allows the researcher. To get some reward from the research, but it means that the the public through the Commonwealth um, that's funding it also retains uh, you know intellectual property, perhaps even the lion's share. You know, you can give income contingent loans. You can give income. You can, research should be funded on an income contingent basis, so that just as Australian students who are going to have to pay back uh, their university education fees once their income goes past a certain level, there's no reason why companies shouldn't have to do the same thing. Right. Um, and, you know, if you look at it, you know, uh, so, I mean, I, I put all these sorts of suggestions, things like that, in, but also various submissions, uh, various submissions to the Senate Economics Committee. Uh, if you look at, I mean, the, the, the Ukraine war is, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has made it, shown us how important gas is, you know, energy is. Uh, well, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, up until the mid 1990s, um, the Bureau of Mineral Resources, which is still the Geoscience Australia, conducted all the bathymetric and geomorphological surveys to map out exactly where the oil and gas was. 
Okay, there, there was a ship that was circumnavigating Australia, would go leave Port Melbourne, go a certain distance, uh, trailing these uh, proton precession magnetometers, which detect the gravity field, the iron, the, the iron content, take it there, turn left, come back. And this was this went on for years. And it's a three-decker ship, scientists on board working 24 hours a day. Once the uh, once the, the, the geoscientific intelligence was obtained, it was turned out that all our uh, oil, our gas resources still were actually of the northwest Cape of Australia, this long, shallow continental shelf. The government just handed it across to the oil company, um, and and there's you know there's um, you'll find an article by me on this uh, on the Michael West website if you want to read the book. Uh, basically, um, Treasury and finance both objected. They said that the oil market is not even company is not even it's not even a competitive industry. Uh, you know we should be recovering more costs. We shouldn't just be handing over all this geoscientific intelligence. So the public bore not just the cost, but more importantly, the risk yeah. of going and working out where risk is more important than cost, okay? Because there might not be anything there. And what did, what did the you know the Northwest Shell project do? They just go up there, put the drill in, which they know how to do very well because it's not and up comes the gas. The gas is then sold on the spot market. It is not connected to the national gas grid. Okay, so the gas is sold on the spot market, not connected to the national gas grid, so that consumers in Japan are paying less, despite the transport costs. Consumers in Japan are paying less for Australian gas than Australian consumers. Okay, not the choice. That's a choice of being wealthy but dependent. It's about saying, look, our aim is to be relevant as a better quarry or a better area for the global market, and for that, we would be relevant, rather than economic nationalists. So I've written about that and about how you could, you know, I'm not talking about nationalizing and what kind of stuff, but really, if you have a private public partnership to retain equity uh, at a time where early on, when the share prices are low, uh, as uh, we heard just now, when CSL's share price was sold at $2 a share, it's now 290 if you were to say, we're going to take equity in this now when the share prices are low, so that as the company becomes more and more pros prosperous, the, the Commonwealth's equity is better. But also the dividends start coming back, and that produces, provides you with a new set of, of in, a new income stream in order to do the kinds of things that you want to do to fight inequality. Right? Um, so that, that's, that's what I mean. It is, it is a dependent, when we look at a dependent defense purchase or a dependent, dependent foreign policy sense, it's, it's not operating as some kind of a quirk, but there is an integrated system of economic dependence, which is responsible for that external dependence. It is only the expression of our, of, of our, our domestic society. Economic cringe. Economic cringe. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Any comments on the uh, similar attitudes in New Zealand? I don't feel confident enough to comment on New Zealand's defence purchases. I know they will not be able to afford um, the nuclear-powered submarines. Um, they have an orientation more towards being a Pacific power um, than being a sub-imperial power to where the United States happens to be. Um, and they show relevance through the Waihopai uh, intelligence base, which is the signals intelligence base, uh, uh, which is part of the United States global intelligence surveillance network. Uh, that's how they do it. And they've actually said that we want to, we, this was said by, their, by the, their prime minister, their foreign minister, that we don't want the Five Eyes intelligence relationship mm -hmm. to become a tool for confronting China. We just want it to be about collecting intelligence. So they have actually bowed out of uh, the, the, the confrontation with China. Uh, they say we're going to do it, we're going to support you passively through intelligence, but not through confrontation. That, that's, I, I, do, I can't tell you that. Uh, but we, we will see what happens for the rest of this decade because you know some very important events occurred uh, this month. Uh, the United States issued a national security strategy whose aim is to contain China. Uh, they've issued a, uh, uh, a protectionist act uh, to prevent the transfer of, uh, this is not a bad thing or a good thing, I'm just trying to see what they've done, uh, to prevent the, the, the supply of semiconductors to China. Um, and along with that comes uh, the, the aim of, of what's called sentinel states. So a number of countries that will be sentinel states to encircle China. Uh, we are one of them, but so is South Korea, so is uh, Japan. And Taiwan 
is regarded, as, in their own words, of course, as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, which will anchor a node from Japan to the Philippines and South Korea. If you look at where Taiwan is, where Japan is, see Japan is across from South Korea, Taiwan's below. Uh, the Philippines is below Taiwan. So that's how they want to, they want to uh, confront China. So we are definitely part of that. Uh, New Zealand is not. Probably have time for one last question. Someone has a question or comment? I've got a question. Sure. Who um, feel hopeful about this situation? If we've had a change of government, mm -hmm. there was supposed to be a whole lot of changes. Do you feel hopeful? Well, the, the, the change of government is definitely uh, from the, the utter. Uh, <laughs> The, the charlatans uh, and uh, the, 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 the incompetence of the of the previous government. It's obviously a change. Uh, but if you ask about me personally, um, I, I I I got my I cut my political teeth quite late. Um, you know, in my I was almost thirty when I became aware of politics. Uh, that's why I joined the army. I was just not political. I just joined the army. Um, and. I cut my political teeth on an impossible cause, uh, the independence of East Timor. Uh, so it's important to act uh, in the absence of worrying about hope. Uh, you know, it's like Pascal's wager about the existence of God. You act as if you, as if you know, to try and do things that are likely to be have some kind of a positive effect, regardless of whether you hope something is is going to happen or not. But yet things are better now. Um, except in the defense space, because Richard Mullis is doing the same policy as, as Peter Dunn. Um, uh, the other thing, of course, is just from Confucius, you know, is the analects. He describes the exemplary human being as, as the one who persists, even though he knows it is useless. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. On that note, please join me in thanking